I guess we should start them when you hear that. <laughs> well, great. So this is, I believe, our third uh, CRP, I call it a town hall forum um, in talking with the other states within Region 10, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Um, they, uh, Washington in particular has done a couple of these. I know some of the other states are doing that as well. And we just think it's important that we have ongoing communication with our CRPs because uh, they are very important to us. And so I thought I was talking with Robin the other day and I just thought it was time for us to kind of do a call with you. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, you uh, growing up in a deaf household, uh, seeing all of you visually just makes me very happy. You don't have to turn on your camera. That's fine. But uh, I can see, you know, Cynthia, Gunner, uh, Amy, thanks for being up on the screen. So I appreciate that. Um, I have a kind of an outline that I want to follow and just kind of bring you up to date in terms of the journey that we had been on for the last 12 months, kind of the state of the state in terms of what's happening in the here and now. And then where are we going? You know, what does, what's the plan for the division within the next three, three months to six months and so forth? So um, I don't need to show you how to navigate the complexities of the Zoom platform. You know, you have, if you want to clap, there's a clap feature where you can hit reactions and then this hand comes up and you can clap. If you want to do a heart, you can do that as well. How, however you feel, you can uh, provide some reaction through that. Uh, you can use the chat feature to communicate. Uh, if you have a couple of questions, you can do that. But I'm totally comfortable if you just raise your hand and just say, hey, I'd like to uh, make a comment or I, I have a question. So let me get you through all the stuff that I think would be important for you to know. And then towards the, the end, we will open up to have a dialogue uh, between you and, and the state. So that, that's the plan. So, so I'll start with uh, letting you all know that we actually started telling work uh, in March of 2020. And I remember that, you know, the, you know, the first uh, set of uh, those individuals in Alaska that uh, were diagnosed with the virus and so forth, what was happening in the Northwest, in particular Washington State and the nursing homes there, it, it came on like a freight train. And so we had to move quickly in terms of coming up with a, what I refer to as a mitigation strategy through the implementation of telework. And so in March, about mid-March or so, we immediately went into our home. The majority of us, not all of us, were able to do that because you got you have to be wired for sound or a certain set of rules that you need to have in place in order to make that happen. So by April 1, April 1st of 2020, we actually uh, put a online application we had to move quickly an online application so that individuals with disabilities who wanted to apply for services could do so online. So we made that happen. So teleworking. Right now, we have about 11% of our staff that are working in the office full time, five days a week, Monday through Friday. We have 11% that are working full-time at home five days a week, have been for some time. And then 78% of our staff have what we refer to as the hybrid model, where it's a, a bit of both. Um, and so they have maybe certain days during the week that they're scheduled to be in the office and then they're at home a certain set of uh, days during that week. So 11% full-time in the office, 11% full-time at home and 78% hybrid model. And so that's a relatively new stat. We always are updating that because it kind of fluctuates from time to time. I just thought it would be important for you to know that. The other thing, so in addition to the online application and there's been changes to that and we'll talk about that in a second. The, the second piece is all of the uh, online tools that we need to put into place in order to do our work. So we have the vocation evaluation program in all five regions, depending on the region, it could be uh, what we refer to as a tier one, which has a lot of tools available 
uh, to staff that do vocational evaluations. We have a tier two office, uh, which would be locations like Fairbanks and Juno. And then tier three would be our smaller offices. But some of the tools that we use in person are now online. So the, the ACE, the uh, Alaska Career Assessment, Explore Your Vocational Goal type of workshop that is online. We have the Explore Your Employment Goal, EYEG, that is online. Job Getting Workshop, that is online. And we're using it. We've been looking at the data. Mariah, our chief, and I have been looking at the data. So we're seeing that it's actually, it's made, we're making a difference in terms of the number of people that are attending those type of workshops. And then when we have staff, uh, counselors that have a consumer that they believe uh, should go through a comprehensive vocational evaluation, we're doing that as well. Now, it may not be to the level that we had when we were doing it in person, but we're doing that as well. So for the most part, when we look at the data, we can see that those online tools truly are making a difference. So uh, just thought I'd share that with you. Everyone that is working from home has a laptop uh, and they have a cell phone and then they're, they're connected to uh, our system so they can go into our aware case management system and be able to do their work. So in the very beginning, a couple bumps along the way, we've refined, we've modified. And so right now, I think that uh, to me, I would say it's the Cadillac approach to how we do our work. People know what, they, what we expect in terms of at home. Monitoring is uh, something we can do through our case management system to see if people are working and doing their job. So we have that. We see a slight uptick in the number of cases. Now, I'm gonna say this and wanna be real clear that, that it's not specific and unique to Alaska, but uh, it is happening throughout the country. And we're very engaged and very involved uh, nationally. You know, that is something that I feel is very important for us as a state is to be engaged with other states in terms of what they're doing. Everyone has seen a downtick. Uh, from the arrival of the pandemic, on average, around 50% to 75% reduction in the number of referrals to those respective divisions and in, in other states. Um, we're at about you know 50% as well, but in the last couple of months, we have seen a slight uptick. So all the work that we're doing to really promote the program, the cold calling, you know, we uh, implemented and went live with Facebook. So we have that. Uh, the department and the work that we've done with the communications team, we have come up with a podcast series that's pretty popular. We've done a couple of interviews through the podcast. I've been uh, reaching out to radio stations to do that as well. Uh, staff have certain requirements to make so many cold calls a month, reaching out to our referral sources as well as to employers. And so we're, so it's a family affair. Everyone is actually doing their part to get the word out. It's not just the division director or our chief of our, our CRP specialist. So everyone has involvement in that effort. We did a survey. So for us, the most important thing is the consumer that we're serving. So we wanted to hear from them. So we created a survey and we sent that out. Uh, I think it was in September of 2020, got all the results back uh, and felt pretty good in terms of the return. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you through this because I think it's important for you to hear some of these sound bites specific to the survey. So as of September 30th of 2020, we sent out 1,139 surveys to consumers. We had a 14.7 response rate, which is typically pretty high, considering uh, what the, the, the language that they talk about when it comes to surveys. If you can get uh, maybe up to 10%, you're doing pretty good. But we got 16% return, about 162 people respond to that survey. So here it is. Just sit back, drink a cup of coffee, and I'm gonna tell you what the consumers are saying. 
49% of the respondents have been, uh, they indicated that they have been with DVR for more than one year. So close to 50% of the people that we're serving have been with us for more than one year. 26% have indicated that they were with us from seven months to a year and 23% less than six months. That's important for us to know. And I think it'd be important for you to know kind of uh, how long have, how long has the journey been for that consumer with us? 79%, close to 80% agreed or strongly agreed that their counselor understood COVID-19 concerns. 14% were neutral and 7% disagreed or strongly disagreed. So looking at those numbers, I thought that was important for us to note. Uh, do our counselors know what we're attending to in the, the situation that we're in as of today? 72% agreed or strongly agreed that they were satisfied with the progress of their DVR case, 72%. 20% roughly were neutral. They didn't have a comment either way. And 9%, uh, less than 10%, indicated that they disagreed. There was something going on where they were not happy, not satisfied in terms of communication with their counselor. In terms of the effect or ability to access service or job opportunities at this time, that's very big in your world, in our world. 24% of the respondents reported they were fearful about using services due to COVID-19. 24%. 10% reported they have stopped using public transportation. 10%. Okay. 25% reported their skills do not match the jobs that, they, that are available at this time. The, the job market is not as plentiful as it was prior to the pandemic, so you, I would expect some of that. 20% reported they needed training on how to use necessary technology. So now that we're rolling forward with telework as us, this virtual world that we live in, you know, having the skill set to be able to do your to work online, 20% indicated that they do not necessarily have the necessary technology to be able to do that online approach. 18% reported that their family responsibilities have increased due to COVID-19. And I have heard this from a lot of our counselors who have said, oh my gosh, just all the additional responsibility. I've heard it from staff, from staff, the schools, uh, being shut down and now your children are at home. So in addition to your day job, you're trying to help your children navigate the complexities of these virtual platforms and so forth. Maybe you have elderly parents that you're attending to or caring for. So some of that uh, definitely has come front and center, not just with our consumers, but with staff as well. 15% responded they needed services. They need services. They are on a are not able to get. So there are certain services that they need, but they can't get to it because of the pandemic. So that got in the way. In terms of comfort with online meetings, and this, this piece, uh, Mariah and I have really looked this, at this closely, 70, close to 78% of the respondents that we surveyed are comfortable with online meetings and have the necessary skills to do so. You know, I, I've had to really force myself to become my own internal IT expert. I don't know about you guys, but I've gotten pretty good. I think I have another job that I can, I mean, I've, I can't just call up somebody. I can't walk down if I'm in the office and say, Mariah, can you come and fix my computer? And she would do that. So I can't, I have to figure it out myself. So. Very important. So almost 80% saying they're pretty comfortable. A little over 13% do not have the skills to meet online, but would like to learn. Okay, so I don't know how to use this virtual platform, but I'm really excited. I want to learn. So they have the enthusiasm. They're not going to close down. 
9% stated that they were not comfortable participating in online meetings. Is it disability specific? They get very uncomfortable with that? I don't know. And so 9%, okay. So that's important to note because we still need to have some type of personal presence because not everybody's going to lock in in this virtual world. So 9%. In terms of job search and placement uh, situation since starting service with DVR, 19% uh, reported starting job search, but putting it on hold due to COVID-19. So close to 20%. 12% reported not yet starting job search. Is it because of the, of the fact that COVID is here? 11% reported losing their job I think this is an important uh, statistic, losing a job, voluntary leaving their job or having a job offer that was postponed due to COVID-19. So about 11 to 12% were impacted because of COVID-19. 15% started job search, but have been unable to find a job. So I think that that, that was important to know. So in terms of feelings about working, and this is the last piece, 51% of the respondents state they are comfortable in going to work. So just a tad over 50% are saying they are comfortable going to work, being there in presence. And about 18 or so percent stated that they wanted to work, but they're not sure it is safe for themselves or others in their household you know, the exposure, uh, depending on what condition they might have or what disability that they might have. So this data that I share with you really gives us a snapshot of where we're at with our, our consumers. Now, mind you, it was back in September of 2020. Uh, and, the, and we shared that going forward, starting in October. Uh, Mariah and I, uh, in fact, I have seen some a series of emails. We're starting to put together another survey to kind of get a snapshot of where we're at with our clients, with our consumers this summer. So we'll be putting that out and hopefully uh, finding ways to get even a better return, better outcome. And that'll be important for us as a division to hear and the next time I do a, a CRP town hall forum and I have already picked the date, um, I will give you an update, see if there's any changes, any differences in the data that we've been able to gather. So that's, that's important. So what's next for us? What's next for the division? And you may have heard this from the, the you know, counselor or manager, but we uh, in all depend upon what happens starting now going forward. Uh, we're seeing evidence that we're kind of starting to settle in a little bit. So we are going to uh, open our offices by appointment only. So where do we get this from? Well, Idaho, Idaho never really shut down. I think they deal with the consequences of that because they had a more significant percentage of people with that had acquired the virus, uh, but they were open by appointment only. But we didn't do that uh, and still haven't. Washington and Oregon haven't done that. But we are all communicating as well as at the national level that we're gonna start to ease back into it by appointment only. So there are gonna, there's gonna be a set of criteria. They will meet you at the door we're not, we are not gonna allow people to sit in the waiting area. They're gonna be escorted from the door of the office to, uh, to the counselor office. Um, and so there'll be a set of protocol that it's already in place, but uh, it's happening in other states and it's gonna be, and it's happening here where you're gonna to have to wear a mask, but you'll be wearing a mask, uh, meeting with that individual in your office, so forth. And each and every time, that individual leaves, we have the, the type of furniture that we can scrub down the surface and do all of those things uh, in terms of keeping our staff safe and our consumers safe. 
And I actually believe that the, the VR world, this is where we need to really truly walk or talk. We're not gonna get into the politics of it and nothing like that. I've been very clear that as far as I'm concerned, I'd probably be wearing a mask up to my last breath. Um, am I gonna fly and go places? Sure. Am I gonna, but I am going to stay well and I'm gonna keep the person across the table for me and make sure that they're gonna be able to stay well. So um, by appointment only starting July 1 in all five of our regions. So it's important that you know that. So I'm going to uh, say one more thing and then we'll open up for just questions or comments. So the US Department of Labor uh, put out a letter and this was under the former administration and it's still, uh, they are gonna hold on to that initiative whereby uh, they sent a letter to all of the governors throughout the country back in September and reminded these governors as, as you develop your plan of recovery um, because of the pandemic, what will you do to factor in people with disabilities? Let's make sure that people with disabilities are not an afterthought. And I think for most of you, including myself, and I've shared this in different forums, I've been dealing with the fact that disability, people with disabilities have been an afterthought since the day I was born. So I wanna make sure that, you know, the states, the US Department of Labor wants to make sure the states are factoring people with disabilities into that plan of recovery. So that letter went to the governor that eventually made its way back to me. And to make a long story short, we have put together a time limited work matters task force to address a variety of existing programs and services and policies that have to do with competitive and integrated employment uh, for Alaskans with disabilities. We are uh, using this task force to generate a list of recommendations that we can then bring forward to the governor as he develops that plan of recovery, um, as well as to the relevant commissioners within government, Department of Labor, Department of Education, Department of Health and Social Services. So that has started. We had our first meeting in an effort to make sure that it actually will do something that we will actually make a difference, that it's not gonna be an exercise. I'm looking at Misty right now, where we do this exercise and it goes and it sits up on this shelf, collects a half an inch of dust. People feel good about it, but then they don't do anything about it. That will not happen. As long as I'm here, that will not happen. So uh, the governor uh, gave me, he anointed me to be the chair. As you can see, I'm pretty definitive right now because you know, we, we need to be a part of the solution when it comes to serving people with disabilities. So last Work Matters Task Force, first meeting was in March. Uh, we have three more meetings. Uh, we have uh, the State Exchange on Employment and Disability at the national level, Bobby Silverstein and others who are legendary people in the field of VR providing technical assistance to us. And so we're gonna come up with a really great plan to make a difference. So we have no choice. So with that, now that I have just gotten very excited about that, I'm going to uh, kind of open it up and you're all on screen, so thank you. Um, I know that it, it, you deal with the pandemic from your perspective and you're getting referrals from us. But what are some things that you have done that you found to be quite successful from your perspective? So I'll, uh, you can raise your hand, make a few comments if you'd like, or I can call on you, which I, I won't do. But what's the one thing that you, you can put your finger on that really has worked quite well for you uh, since we've been living in this virtual world? I'll start. Can you guys hear me okay? I had to yeah. put some headphones on. Um, Thanks, Dan. So 
I think so Morningstar Ranch, we we never really closed. I think that there was about a week where we shut down until we got some guidance from um, the state as far as how to remain open as an agency. Um, and something that worked really well for, for us is that we continued to provide as much like educational resources as we could as we went. Um, we had weekly meetings with our staff. Um, we kept our communication uh, pretty wide open with the, the parents and the guardians. Um, and we've had a few providers and clients that um, have either contracted the virus or had primary exposure. But um, I think that with our continued education and diligence, we've been lucky enough to not have any uh, clusters in our agency. And I feel like for us, it was just trying to be as quick to get information out as possible. And um, including when we found out that we were part of one of the first few phases uh, for vaccinations, you know, obviously we can't force our providers to go get vaccinated, um, but we, we highly encouraged it um, and just gave them all the information that we could. And that's that's been pretty successful for us so far. So ongoing and regular uh, weekly staff meetings so mm -hmm. that everyone knows what's happening. Uh, ongoing uh, and regular communication with your community providers. Um, and then incur you're not uh, taking a position specific to the vaccine mm -hmm. or anything specific to COVID, but just uh, education, education, and education. Mm -hmm. and, and just leading with the this information might change. What we say today might be um, advised against in a month. Um, and we've been pretty lucky that most of our guardians and providers have been pretty understanding and flexible with us because especially last March when we closed for a week and we're all kind of like, oh crap, like what do we, what do, we do here? <laughs> um, everyone's been fortunately very flexible and understanding that you know we're all kind of here together trying to figure this out. So um, that's really worked for us. Very good. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'm going to actually, uh, Giles. Yes. How you doing? I'm Giles good. Hawthorne. I'm from the bridge here in Fairbanks. Um, I've been working, um, well, with this with a CRP position, I've found it helpful that I've been staying in contact with uh, one of the employees in our local office here, Liz Markle. Um, she's also uh, on several meetings with us throughout the month, usually about two a month. Um, and also, I get you know frequent correspondence from Robin um, about upcoming training, so that's always uh, helpful um, because things are changing, and I always check uh, you know for additional trainings for for some of the peer support and some of the employment services, because we're finding out that a lot of these problems that people have, uh, they're very organic and uh, they're also mutually exclusive. So, uh, you know, one size fit for a lot of people simply doesn't work. However, speaking on um, the topic you had earlier, Dwayne, about technology. Yeah. Uh, we started a program here, a very, very basic class on how to navigate technology and it starts at the very basics with um, you know, what upload, what download, what copy paste, some of the basic things that a lot of folks don't know how to do. Um, and it's going to move up into Zoom and I'd like to have a basic Zoom class just how to get onto a Zoom. I don't want them to um, necessarily know how to set up a Zoom account, but should they have a provider that they have to meet with and say, hey, here's a link. They go, oh, what's the link? Um, these are things that are, are, are occurring to me um, that are appearing to us, uh, that problems have always been there, we just didn't see it. And I think COVID brought that out. Now we rely so much on keyboards and, and smartphones. And um, these folks have either been incarcerated for a very long time or just they haven't been exposed, or had the uh, accessibility to some of these devices. So um, that's one thing that we can certainly do uh, to mitigate for the problems is to teach and from there on after, it, it's up to them to take those next steps and to use that um, for their benefit. So uh, that was a great point. And I'm sorry I got here late, but I, I did catch that that information, Dwayne. So thank you. You bet. 
Well, I appreciate, so what I uh, took from what you just said, Giles, uh, the one thing that stands out for me is that you are, you have set up a class and you're helping those that sign up for this class, uh, just the basics of navigating technology. I have heard that it, that's happening in other states and um, I actually think that that's probably a, a huge, I don't know if anybody else has done that, but to have classes uh, to navigate the complexities of technology, I'll be the first to sign up. I think not only is it, it's probably quite overwhelming for them. Getting any group yeah. going is, is tough to do initially, it's a long time. Yeah. But as long as the, all we can do is provide the opportunity um, and we have to sell it, obviously, because there are a lot of these folks that we deal with um, are simply not in a position that they really have to prioritize, you know, food or do I show up for a class? So as long as the availability is there, um, it, it's going to be something that will pay you. Mm -hmm. And the class, hey, you can put one together yourself, 10 slides on a PowerPoint on how to do anything. So it, yeah. there's no proprietary information that we have to seek right. out, although, you know, it does fine. So thanks. That's a good point. Thanks. Cynthia. Thank you. All right. So I just wanted to tell Giles that I think that is a wonderful idea um, because that is the biggest problem is that, is that people don't really know how to use it. So they sort of shy away. We need to reach out to these people. I'd love the idea of training people how to do these things. And he's right. It's not hard to teach people how to do it. We just need to organize it and find a way to get it out there. Um, second of all, <clears throat> welcome to my world. I have always preferred to do it this way. I'm immune suppressed. People make me sick. So <laughs> this is the best way for me to work. And I'm, I'm really glad at the changes in our society and our culture that have enabled a lot of people with disabilities to get back into it. And this is a great way to do it. So, and I love the training idea. I really think we should jump on that. Robin, I really, I think that would be a great thing to do. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks Cynthia. Misty? You said technology, you're talking my language. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't wait to call on you. <laughs> uh, that was the biggest thing that we saw when all this started was we just, we always knew there was a gap mm -hmm. in basic, very basic knowledge base. And running an assistive technology place, we don't really train people on basics. We always saw that gap, but then when COVID happened, that gap just got huge. And it was too big for really one agency to even think of fulfilling. So thank you so much, Giles. Um, I did want to share a resource and I can put it in the chat with you guys. Um, we have started working, we've built a Google site <clears throat> because it's very easy for us to manage um, very quickly on the fly. And it's um, primarily for iPad users. And so it's set up with beginner and in intermediate and advanced and we'll soon be adding some Zoom and some of those regular platforms and it's gonna stay up forever. So we vet the videos and the information on there and then monthly staff are going through and adding their favorite picks, app picks for the week or for the month um, in a variety of areas, whether it's productivity or communication or whatever it is. So bookmark it and feel free, Giles, if you do an iPad class, use this and as much as you want it's all there so has your world picked up uh, substantially in the last 12 months because i know that you were uh, the day that you actually made the decision to telework was the day that you actually were moving from one location to another so I bet that was pretty challenging, but uh, yep. we, we had just moved and we were open for one hour in our new location when we had to close and um, staff chose to stay in the office for that week because that was the week that the news was really starting to break and everybody was kind of like, oh, it's not going to hit Alaska. And by that Friday, one of my staff had already 
possibly been um, infected and got a call. So we mm -hmm. just shut down right away. Um, it did impact us, but not in the way we expected. We've seen 352% more clients in this one year than wow. any other year. Wow. So Th we're busy. 352% increase. Yeah. And you've not had that ever before? Not this many. Not even that close? No. <laughs> wow. Not even close. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for that. Anybody not else? Any DVR. Of course, our DVR numbers are down for yeah. CFP, but all of our other programs are through the roof. And really, a lot of our DVR clients that we have got, we've turned and said, actually, we have other programs we can support them with. They're going to be, um, you know, dual enrolled in other programs that we already right. have. So we'll just, so that's worked. Right. So I'm going to call on Mariah just real quickly. So we did hear from people that, you know, when we had to move quickly with the online application process, um, you know, it, we did get some complaints that in order to complete the application, you had to print off the document, fill it out, and then send it in. Uh, there was no feature at that time where you could just hit the send button and then off it went. Um, so we we regrouped and a little over a month ago, and we're seeing uh, the numbers go up slightly. Maybe it's because it's a much more user-friendly approach to applying for services online. It's through SurveyMonkey. Mariah, did you want to just say a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm trying to get uh, just a quick um, number of updates. <laughs> I can't spell. I'm just checking to see how many we might have gotten just in the just in the last two weeks. So. We did realize and recognize that our system that we kind of rushed to put into place to accept kind of the, the, the beginning application process was a little um, was a little difficult for individuals to navigate. It was a PDF to kind of have to save it. So that I means they'd, they'd have to be at a computer um, or, or device that could actually save that. So what we did is we decided to go ahead and change the process. Um, over to, we already had a SurveyMonkey account. We use it all of the time in customer satisfaction surveys. And uh, as, as Duane had mentioned earlier, our um, client survey that we did back in September. So we went ahead and actually just adapted SurveyMonkey to be able to actually ask all of the questions that we would normally ask in our participant information questionnaire by switching over to SurveyMonkey. We made it more portable uh, you can do it on a smartphone now or on a tablet versus having to kind of be on a PC to be able to save that document somewhere. So we've actually, the first the first weekend that we, we rolled it out actually at like 4.30 on a Friday, it went live. And by that following, it was a holiday weekend, so there was three days. Uh, and that following Tuesday, we had at least 18 applications that we had gotten just over the weekend. So we're seeing people are feeling like it's, it's, it's more comfortable for them to kind of go through. We also have made a couple of tweaks. We, we made a, a um, option for people to go Go ahead and just click. I don't want to do that. I don't want to fill this out right here, right now, but I would like for somebody to contact me. And here's my phone number. And this is the community in which I live. So there are certainly people that are going to get on and they're going to be like, I'm not going to give all of my personal information out to some stranger. And so we built that in as an option for those folks who might not necessarily be very comfortable with it. Um, I just quickly asked our data person what that's looked like since we rolled that out would have been Seward today. So that would have been um, March 26th because that was that three day weekend. So we rolled it out March 26th and we've had 94 individuals have interacted at least with that survey uh, somehow or another since we rolled that out. So what, three, four weeks? One, two, three. So this is the fourth week that it's been up. Very good. Well, so we're feeling pretty good about uh, the changes that we made there. 
and obviously uh, we're always up for anything that uh, we think we can how we can do it much better if we need to make additional tweaks then we'll do that so um thanks mariah anybody else anything uh, that you would want to share with us that that um has worked well for you I could call on Dan, Dan, Danny Parrish. I've known him for a long time. Now we see his curly hair, which is, it's very nice. Uh, anything, Danny, from your perspective that you, that you've come across that you think really works well, given this pandemic? <laughs> there well, he is. We um, <laughs> reached out to Misty right away because we knew we needed a lot of technology support. All of our rec center classes went zoom right away and has been out actually statewide um, for me as supported employment a lot of my individuals um, stayed home just because of the fear uh, family members um, had so um, some I think about 16 of the individuals that I support um, continue to work throughout the pandemic because they were frontline workers uh, so that really kept me busy because i needed to stay and try to keep job coaches scheduled and support scheduled um, i came to work every single day um, also right at the beginning of the pandemic i lost my spouse of 26 years so mm. i needed something to keep my mind busy so yeah. i just came to work and it worked out really well um, the people that continued to work um, went through a couple of different job coaches because some of the job coaches that uh, were with me um, were not prepared to go out and work in the community um, mm -hmm. frontline stuff but um, a lot of it was done you know on telephones you know um, duo and zoom the individual would have their cell phone and we would call and say okay i'm gonna send you a link click on it so you can see me and tell me how things are going and um, let me talk to your job coach and so it was a lot of that and a lot of support for the employers um, employers were um, as well as everybody else a little frightened of um, all the people coming in out of their businesses that stayed open um, so it worked out um, and, and people are starting to go back to work now and um, now i'm struggling to hire enough job coaches because I have people that are wanting to go to work and employers mm -hmm. saying, well, it's been so long, I want support. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been a good thing and a bad thing. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Dan. So yesterday, or today is Monday, Sunday, Saturday, I was in Eagle River. I don't know if anybody here lives in Eagle River. They built this beautiful, it's a Thai restaurant called Lime Leaf. I don't know if anybody has seen it. It's a really gorgeous building. And I, when I, uh, it was about two months ago, I could see that the parking lot was just jammed full of cars. We went and ordered our food and then we picked it up and left. And I was pretty surprised by how many people were there. So Saturday, not one car in the parking lot. Wow. Dead, just totally dead. So I mentioned it to my wife, Macrina, um, yesterday uh, on Sunday, she goes, oh, um, they can't find enough employees. So they they shut down, not because of the customer, lack of customers, they, they get a lot of people coming to their place. It's a beautiful uh, restaurant. It's they can't find enough staff. Uh, so they had no choice but to shut it down for, for now. So then I did a little bit of looking into that. I think that's happening uh in other areas as well other industries where you just don't have a, a service industry in particular so that is a bit concerning anybody else note that at all i see misty shaking her head yeah um at morningstar we've had a really difficult time um i feel again speculating that the unemployment is too good to pass up um yeah. and i think that since january we've scheduled, I think like 30 or 35 interviews and it had like less than a dozen actually show up. Mm -hmm. um, and only one of them 
after the interview actually agreed to be employed and everyone else just seems like they're just hitting their check boxes. Um, and I don't know if other agencies in town are experiencing that, but mm -hmm. um, it's certainly unexpected. I didn't expect to like say, hey, do you want some money to come work for us? And people would say, I'd rather stay at home. Um, so that's, it's been really difficult because we have with all the group homes reopening yeah. and clients finally being allowed to get out of the house, um, we just frankly don't have the staff to do so. So we're having to get creative and do like, you know, these clients only get half their hours this week so that we can get more and um, certainly not a situation that we want to be in. It's, it's right. been very difficult. Well, it, it is concerning and we'll have to watch that closely and do what we can uh, uh, as a part of an industry to try to bring warm bodies uh, as long as it's, it aligns with that individual's desires and interests. So that's important. So we have, it's, we got 12 minutes left. And before I go to this next topic, um, I am going to, uh, Robin and I talked this morning and she liked it. I wanted to make sure she was okay with it. And so and when she said, yes, I think we should do it. And we haven't even talked to Mariah yet. So maybe Mariah won't like it, but we'll see. We'll just watch her reaction. So we think we need to do a survey with you. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of create that, uh, not with the intent of, you know, tell us, uh, tell us how bad we are or what have you. What we would want to do is to allow you an opportunity to provide us with some recommendations and some solutions as to what we could do to better our efforts in working with you and working with the consumer. So uh, our intent is to do that survey. Um, we were thinking in the, it'll be this summer. We have the survey with the consumer, but I think a survey with you is just so we can get some feedback from you as well. So um, did I get that right, Robin? You did, and before I, unless you're going to make the announcement about the webpage, um, Denise had her hand up, so she might have something to say too. Oh, it's okay. I was just going to tell Dwayne, uh, not much changes out here in the bush. We all just put our head down and plow through it. Yeah. But the one thing that has been interesting is people that were laid off for whatever reason. Uh, a lot of the corporations closed their doors and a lot of people were working from home and for whatever reason, weren't working, whatever. Um, what I have seen is my recidivism program has boomed because <laughs> they were not on unemployment. They're getting out of jail. They're not on unemployment and they are desperate for jobs. So the recidivism program has just been off the chart, which is the first time ever. So I'm thrilled about it. Wow. Coming out of jail, um, you know, of course, uh, what are they, what's the data, uh, Denise, that shows, you know, 6% of people that are coming out of corrections have a, a disability, um, more than likely a, a mental illness. Uh, and maybe a co-occurring and other secondary disability, substance abuse, what have you. So coming out of correctional facilities, not on unemployment, needing to desperately go to work. That's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Well, and it's different out here in the bush because when you talk about even our homeless, you know, the statistics are one in four, but out here in the bush, it's more like one to two. Yeah. So, and those are the frequent flyers that are always going to jail. They're in, you know, you get multiples and then you're in for a stint and then you get out and you try to try it again, you know, but um, I would say probably 70% of those are frequent flyers and are homeless. Denise, are you, do you utilize the fidelity bonding option through the Department of Labor? Say it again, Robin, sorry. Fidelity bonding. Bonding. Fidelity bonding. No. Well, they're, not, they're not going to jobs at banks or they're washing cars, washing dishes. They're, they're uh, mechanics, painting houses on the inside. I mean, we have 13 feet of snow out there. There's not, 
much going on that is on the outside. So no construction, anything like that. And, you know, most of this has happened within probably the last seven months, six to seven months. So that's been mostly during our winter here. Very good. Thanks, Denise. So what do you, uh, so before I, we have eight minutes to go, the survey will help capture some of this that we'll put out here in the near future. So uh, just be uh, on the lookout for that. And if you could respond and boy, what a, what a treat would be if we got a hundred percent response. So if we had that, I, I just might uh, retire. I'd be just so overjoyed that that actually happened. So um, let's, let's uh, make sure that you do the survey for us. But with uh, seven minutes to go, any final comments? Um, anything you want to share? Nobody fill in the survey so Dwayne doesn't retire. How about that? <laughs> Uh, well, we were all going to say maybe we won't do it if he's going to oh, retire. Okay. So maybe a hundred percent, you might be asking too much, Dwayne. I know. <laughs> that probably was not a good good way of saying that. So let me well, retract it. Are you, are you following Senate Bill Six, Dwayne? What's that, Robin? Are you following Senate Bill Six of the legislature? Uh, well, I heard about that. Yes. <laughs> If it passes, what she's referring to is, you know, they're in government. Um, there, if you've been around for 20 years, and if you're over a certain age, um, you know, they uh, right, they will give you an additional three years and incentivize you to go ahead and retire, um, and then they will have a vacant position, and they uh, will either downgrade it or bring somebody in who's got uh, less than one year of experience. So. The, the pay goes down. So they're just, it's strategies that they do in state government. I'm not saying good or bad that they do in order to try to balance the budget. So that's what you're talking about. Right? That. <laughs> the yeah. corporations do it too, doing. Yeah. So it's not just government. Huh? Yeah. Nonprofits don't do it. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping that this is uh, helpful. We'll, we'll, uh, Amy, did you want to say something? Um, you were talking about uh, counselors being able to meet with clients by appointment in the office, yeah. you know, possibly soon, which I think is great for some clients. Um, is there going to be an opportunity for clients to use the resource room by appointment where a CRP could meet in the resource room with the client? Because right now the library is closed. Uh, it's my appointment to use the computers there, but it's kind of, um, you know, limited hours or just and limited scheduling. And so that can make it hard because I'll be taking my laptop, you know, to a restaurant or wherever there might be Wi-Fi so that we can do these things together. So they're learning, you know, at the same time. So I don't know if opening up a resource room by appointment would be a good idea or so the, the, we, that is the plan. And so we uh, very much intend to open up the resource room as well by appointment. Remember, that's the key. Uh, the conversation about whether or not uh, uh, a CRP and the evaluator, the, the evaluation staff person and the individual meeting together. Um, Mariah, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, we were looking at probably kind of doing a kind of a first come first serve as far as reserving space in the uh, in resource rooms. We'll have to be really careful ensuring we're maintaining distance, wiping things down in between uses. It would probably be for a chunk of time. Um, we're working with our evaluation team to kind of look at what that might be, what might be appropriate for that. So maybe like a two hour block or something like that. So when that's up, then another person has another opportunity to go in and, and get that. Um, I would say if that was required for a CRP to accompany an individual, I would highly recommend having a conversation with the counselor first um, to determine how, how that should look. Um, we're also kind of hoping that maybe with <clears throat> the weather getting nicer and getting warmer and things like that, people might have more for like the job center, people can come and <clears throat> maybe do some work sitting outside and picking up some of the Wi-Fi 
Um, obviously, they'd have to have a device to be able to utilize, but we we're just kind of hoping that maybe that might be something that people are able to at least use some use some services. Um, but the, the, I would recommend that that if it was going to be in tandem like that, that that would be a discussion between the the counselor um, and you and the individual as to how to best accomplish that. So we, I would say, so Ryan's correct. Just check in with the counselor. Um, I've actually had meetings where, uh, you know, two, three people at a time in a large conference room and we maintain our distance. We uh, keep our masks on. And, and so I'm feeling very comfortable. They're feeling very comfortable. So I think it's quite doable as long as we're just communicating. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I, I mean, I do meet with clients. And so right now we just have to meet in very public places. So it would be nice, especially if, if you could by appointment, have a quiet yeah. spot for people yeah. that need to focus more. I'm glad you brought it up. So it, it, it's here in my head now. So that's a good thing. And it's not going anywhere. All right. So survey this summer. Um, don't, uh, if you decide you don't want to do it, that's good. I see Danny gave us a thumbs up. So he's very, uh, he knows how to do his formal reaction. So that's a good thing. Um, and then we'll shoot for another town hall forum in October of, of 2021. So we're, that's about six months from now. So we'll check in with each other. And so just be mindful to things that you, you want to share um, at that time. So Thanks for calling in. I it's 159. Robin, yes. <laughs> you forgot to website, the CRP website. You can't oh yes. Out. And your uh, mic is breaking on and off, but let me I'll try to interpret. I failed to mention that we did some massive upgrades to the CRP website. So um, check it out. Sound good? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.